This is the Florida Aquifer. This is up around Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, is where it extends up to, runs on down, and, and completely is, underlies Florida. Little teeny bit, bit of Alabama. Um, this little dish out of here in the blue is where the aquifer is exposed at the surface. Um, you can walk around and, and kick limestone rocks, right? The rest of this is covered with um, clays of what's known as the Hawthorne Formation. They call it the Hawthorne Formation because the well drillers, the geologists first looked at the corings that came up out of a well right near the, the little town of Hawthorne, which is just, just east of Gainesville. Um, and so that's the Hawthorne Formation of clays. But here's a look at what's going on down underground. I talked about these big rooms that are dissolving away down there that the surface comes crashing down into. This is Silver Glen Springs on the other side of the Suwannee River, right? It's one of the St. John's River Springs that your springs here are related to. And um, that guy right out there is Eric Hutchison, this fellow right here. And I'm on a, on a ledge at 100 feet deep. I get the credit for the picture because I'm the photographer, right? It was my camera. Uh, we got a fellow up in the ceiling at 55 feet, would be, which would be way up here. The bottom is 160 feet, and Eric is swimming around, and he purposely caught the silhouette. There's actually two Eric's right there, and, and look right there. There's another one, <laughs> and here's his arm sticking out. He didn't quite hide good enough on that one, <laughs> but he popped that strobe off 35 times. It took him like an hour to swim around there and do that. I sat behind the camera. I actually fell asleep. It was kind of boring. You know, he was doing all the work. <laughs> I get all the credit, it's great. But anyhow, um, this, this cave is 55 feet below, the, the top roof of the thing is 55 feet deep. So if you go out in the spring, that's the, that water level just runs right into the ground, right? And we're 55 feet down below that. And there maybe is 20 feet of land surface above that. So there's about 70 feet of rock and sand above the roof of this, this giant room. This room, by the way, is about 120 feet across. And, um, Someday that roof is going to weaken and it's going to collapse and there's going to be another nice blue sinkhole out there in the woods by, uh, by Lake George. This is over near a place called Dyke Holders over on the west coast. And this is when divers are way back in Wikiwashi Springs. They're about 400 feet deep here. These are the size of some of these rooms, and these probably aren't even the biggest rooms, right? These are just ones we know about. There's ones down there that we'll never see. So that's what's created all these big springs and things we've got. This is Wapella Springs. Uh, right below the lip of the cave, which is right there, it's 110 feet deep. This thing drops on down underneath the hotel over here to over 300 feet deep, and it's a big hole. There was an alligator attack here. We had a, a, um, a diving project where we came and lived there for like a month and a half. And, and uh, there was a graduate student from FSU who was swimming over there, way out of the swimming area, right? And, and um, an alligator got hold of him and did him in. And he was discovered, these are glass bottom boats over here, just like the ones at Silver Springs. And there's an old black fellow that used to run one of those boats. And, and we talked to him later. And they, it was his boat that spotted. He, he started the old rap of, well, there's old George. It looks like he's got him a deer to eat or something. And they did a double take. It was an arm sticking out of its head. So old George is now stuffed and on display <laughs> in, the, uh, in the lobby of the old hotel. So when I was your age, we didn't really see that many alligators. They had been pursued and hunted so and poached so relentlessly for their valuable hide, right, to make shoes and leather belts and ladies' handbags out of, that we just didn't see that many of them. And, um, but they are everywhere now, and they can show up anywhere. If you got a backyard swimming pool, take a look in the pool before you're hopping in the morning, because there could be one there, you know. They, they get up and wander around the landscape, and they can show up anywhere. This is Silver Springs. There, this, this whole arch around here is the big main entrance to Silver. And this is one of the largest springs and sets of springs on the continent. Um, Silver's, Silver's average flow used to be 900 cubic feet per second. So imagine a cubic foot of water and 900 of those going by every 1,001. And that's it. That's a lot of water, right? 
Silver is not the mighty silver anymore. We are pumping so much water out of the aquifer that silver now tends to flow. Well, right now it's probably flowing about 500 CFS. Um, back during the 2001 drought, it dropped all down below 300. So what's happening with silver is the old low is the new high. So here is the, um, the spring shed of Volusia Blue Springs. You all know what a watershed is, right? The area that water collects in, rainwater falls, it all comes down <clears throat> and goes to a stream. So that's the watershed of, let's say, the uh, Colorado River. Um, well, we, we used to talk about underground watersheds. Now we've changed the name to spring shed. And um, this is the area that rainfall falls in this area right here, more or less, that trickles into the ground is what comes out of the spring over here. So every spring has a spring shed. Um, a friend and I came here one day, and we sat right there, and we had a flow meter. And it, it basically looks like a little torpedo, and the water racing by it um, deflects a little magnetic field and gives you a number of how fast the water is going. And we measure six feet per second. And we measure a lot of, of flow rates in, in places around the state in these springs, and that's the highest we've ever measured. Six feet per second, if you stick your head over the edge of, of the edge there into that flow, it rips your face mask off. It makes your regulators free flow, right, so you don't, can't breathe very well. Um, that's an awful lot of water. Um, there's a story associated with this. There's a couple young guys that live in Orange City. And they got their cabin diving certification, and they, and they headed right over here. And when they took a, best I can tell, they took a rope with a, a weighted grappling hook on there. Threw it over the edge and they got caught on something. And it's always the strongest kid that gets killed. Um, <clears throat> so the one guy, he 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 managed to pull himself down a few feet on that rope, and and then he it, he couldn't hang on any longer and he blew up, which would have been just fine except that big rock. He ended up this rock is actually flat on the bottom. It's not pointed like that. He ended up pinned under that rock and he couldn't move and he stayed there for three days. So, um, flowing water is a nice thing to stay in. This is what our spring runs used to look like. Our spring basins and runs were among the most, are among the most productive um, ecosystems on Earth, kind of like salt marshes are. And one of the reasons is, is you've got this never ending supply of, of nice water coming out. It's low in nutrients, but it's constantly being replenished. Um, it carries away metabolic byproducts from the plants, and um, the water is very clear, so it allows sunlight to penetrate down and grow these, these beautiful aquatic beds. And this is what this is what you get with the um, with the fertilizers. While it's underground, you don't notice it because you got to have three things to grow plants, right? Including algae, you got to have sunlight, water, and nutrients. Well. Down underground, we got the water and we got the nutrients. And once it comes out and it's exposed to sunlight, so a lot of our springs are looking like this. So I better speed up here. Um, these, we have these conduits down here, right, that move lots of water under the landscape. Underground rivers, they are truly underground rivers. Geologists used to hate that term, but they actually use it now. But our, 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 our Aquifer caves are more than just um, conduits that move water around. They're also um, unique habitats for these, for these rare um, and, and um, beautiful animals. That's a, uh, Mark took this picture. That's a, a cave adapted crayfish, the pallid cave crayfish over in Peacock Slough. Often they'll hang up on, upside down on the ceiling like spiders, and when divers come by, the bubbles will knock them off, right, and become parachutes. We've probably got about 18 species of cave crayfish, and I'm sure there's a few more to be discovered. Um, they've got what you would typically figure from a troglobite, right? Uh, these are animals that live in caves. Um, they're dependent upon caves. They cannot live outside of a cave. They're white or blind. Um, if they, if they get blown out of a cave, they're like, well, ask a minute. There's going to be a brim or a bass or something that's going to eat them right off the bat. This is the spider cave crayfish. This is the most cave adapted of any crayfish in the world. These antenna, they're off the picture. They're like out here somewhere. 
Um, they got these long, thin legs. This little guy is only about an inch and a half long. These long, elongated mouth parts with little bitty hairs in here like combs. And they're probably combing protozoans out of volcanic sediments. Um, they have a kind of a wide distribution compared to a lot of the other ones. Which makes us, and, and these are these could be animals of the deep aquifer, right? Far from any cave entrance. And we suspect that maybe at, at times these caves may be, or maybe they still are, connected in, to some extent. And and these guys can move back. I, you know, if you go places that most people don't go, you discover things. Um, and so I discovered this cave crayfish in a little place called the Devil's Sinkhole, and and they named it my honor. And so the family name, Procambarus morrisi, the family name lives on in an obscure journal that about a dozen people know about on the whole continent, right? So that's fame for you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, that's it. This deadly spring. Crush it under your nose. Don't just smell it, crush it. Yeah, it's, that it's, releases the aromatic oils. Do people put this in there? Yeah. You said it was an aster, the aster family. Um, it's a, yeah, which is the daisy, the sunflower. Really? Yeah. No, I love it. Yeah, I was going up in that little flesh of the hole in there and you can open it. Yeah, That's what happened to me. I was wondering. Yeah. 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 Okay. And I, I use it too. Because I have the inside. So. Do you have the contact? No, this one. Is that a brand new face mask? Yeah. yeah. They tend to do that. Um, try some algae in it. <laughs> that works. And you know what? Let me see that mask, too. I'm going to take this algae. It looks awful, but... She's pulling her nose off. Yes. Well, I, I had a mask that quit, quit, yeah. quit fogging, and I took this stuff the other day, and it stopped it. So, let's give it a try. <laughs> It's so irritating when a mask just keeps fogging. Yours is doing good. Uh -huh. Mine's good. <laughs> Yours is good too. Mine's like. You're the lucky one. Man. You get that. Yeah. Mask. <laughs> that looks lovely. <laughs> right, let's put a little soap in it again and see what happens. So put another drop of soap in there. Another drop of that soap.
fun, isn't it? Just to yeah. swim around. I had. It's a great. It's a great <laughs> free diving spring. You know. It's what we used to. What you do as kids, you know. And oh, I. Like why we like the stuff, huh? So, so that was the soon. obliging gar posing for me. So you posed the way they're you very, did. they're very obliging. Like if you kind of start to have like, swimming in the current, then they kind of turn around. Well, you get, oh, it's, it's cool here. It's cold. And it's beautiful. <laughs> so did you see the fracture? Yes. And we went there and I sit on the wood and it's like so pretty and I love it. <laughs> oh, cool. Which building it'll be in, but they're next door to each other, so it'll be easy to find. Our first speaker is going to be a visiting scholar from uh, manatees. 11 manatees. 11 manatees, and those images went around the world. Uh, years later, uh, his son, also a photographer and, and, and conservation, Jean Michel Cousteau, was Atlantic Center for the Arts being honored, and he talked about. Talked about how